Well, good evening, everyone. I'm from the Bahamas, and when we say good evening, the audience says, good evening, ba. <laughs> it's also something I've learned in the Caribbean also, so it's not just the Bahamas. And Curacao, by definition, is very much a Caribbean country. Uh, I'm eternally grateful to uh, Dennis, Alexander, Jacob, uh, Mikhail, um, Senui, the entire TEDx team, in fact, for extending a kind invitation to me uh, to visit Curacao and to speak to you about renewable energy and alternative energy in the Caribbean society. I am smiling and I'm looking at Minister Hakim because uh, yesterday he and I were in New Orleans where I was the guest speaker and I found a way to get into Curacao. So what's he doing in New Orleans? <laughs> By the way, if you, if, if you were out on Bourbon Street uh, late at night, the, the only flight out of New Orleans to get in the, to Curacao was to leave at 6 a.m. Uh, into Miami, you get in at about 8.40, you run to catch the Curacao connection. And so if my eyes are bloodshed, it's, it's only because I really wanted to make an effort to be here, and I expect I'll get some rest uh, on my way back up to Miami. Um, I think that um, Curacao, as a quaint little Caribbean country that's an island, um, really sits at a, cross, at a cross point in the Caribbean and really sets itself up to be an example and an interconnective point for the ideas that uh, we have envisioned for bringing renewable energy into the Caribbean. What makes Curacao different from most of the Caribbean islands is Curacao is a conventional energy part of the chain. Uh, the refinery here provides substantial employment, GDP output, et cetera, in this economy. And yet at the same time, this is a country that has embraced its social and moral responsibilities for making the world a better place and reducing uh, its consequent effect on climate change, which affects all of us Caribbean countries. In fact, um, if the polar ice caps continue to melt, uh, for every one, I guess for every uh, one foot rise, they say in the ocean, my country, the Bahamas, which is a country of 700 islands, we expect to lose 72% of our total land mass. Uh, my highest point in the Bahamas is 300 feet above sea level, and I grew up calling that Mount Alvernia. <laughs> so, uh, you could imagine my flat chain of islands where uh, we go scuba diving, fishing, we, we usually hit a lobster or, or probably a, uh, a jack, a group, or a snapper, and we have that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Imagine that all being submerged, and you'll begin to understand uh, our social responsibility in this construct. That being said, I imagine a Caribbean that accepts its responsibility for jump-starting the introduction of renewable energy into its entire sustainable fr framework. Now, in the Caribbean, as opposed to North America, and even the Latinos in, in South America, where you have a contiguous landmass, we have this uh, beautiful challenge that is also uh, a, 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 a source of uh, our total problem associated with energy. Most Caribbean countries are small island states with very little economies of scale. For the most part, 70% of them use imported fossil fuels to power their energy grid. The way they use electricity and the way they use power is really for two parts of life. The first is they use energy on the grid so they have monopolistic utility companies that engage in generation and transmission and distribution to protect those companies and to take advantage of the fact that they are small scales, they're going to be monopolies. Uh, because they are buying their fossil fuels in effect from the world markets, those utilities and those Caribbean countries are subject to incredible costs associated with energy. In fact, um, a sister country like, like mine, uh, just north of the Bahamas, Bermuda, 
their cost per kilowatt hour of, of selling onto the grid is 56 cents on average. Jamaica, 42 cents per kilowatt hour. The Bahamas, my country, 30 cents per kilowatt hour. You compare that to, say, Miami, 18 cents per kilowatt hour. And you understand that if you're in the touristic business like Curacao is, and I'm representing a group of hotel investors, and I know 40% of my ongoing operations costs in running a hotel is going to be power use. My decision, if I've got the money to build a hotel and a casino where there's sand, sea, and sun, might very well end up being onshore in Miami, huh? which means that my competitive edge as a Caribbean country is directly affected by my dependence on fossil fuels and by my inability to produce energy at the right rate. So it then starts to become very critical that renewable energy or an alternative source of energy that's sustainable, less expensive, can be introduced. And this continues to be the challenge because you're working against a circular path where if you rely on fossil fuels, price of oil could jump to as high as $147 per barrel, as it did three years ago, and all of your plans for growth and sustainable development goes in the next direction because you're taking a substantial portion of your purse donating and, and giving it really to something as simple as energy cost. The other way Caribbean countries use energy is for transportation. And imagine being in Miami and buying gasoline and hearing the U.S. complain at $2.96 a gallon and being in the Bahamas where I live, where I regularly pay upwards to $6 a gallon for gasoline. Uh, so again, from a competitive perspective, if a guy flies in and he has to take a taxi from my airport to his business center, it's going to cost him about three times as much. And you know, I, I, I had the Curacao taxi experience when the guy <laughs> Last night, when he told me how much my taxi to the Cura cost, I said, well, how far is it for me to walk? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, I mean, it was just, but, so now that, I mean, out of adversity comes opportunity. So that leads to our kind of thinking as to what we might look for when it comes to transportation and how we, how we fix transportation and introduce, and introduce renewable energy into that construct. I have driven from Iguazu in the south, which is the largest and the world's most beautiful falls in Brazil, all the way up to, who's been to Brazil? Okay, let me test you. Who has the best carnival? Is it Rio? <laughs> it's, it's in the, well, not Curaçao. <laughs> Though I heard that, the Trinidadians might, might, might argue, but uh, actually it's in Salvador, Bahia in the north. So if you go from Brazil in the south all the way up to the north, by the way, there's a, there's a beautiful little Caribbean hotel in Salvador Bahia, a Jamaican hotel where nobody speaks English, but everyone can sing a Bob Marley song. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. The, the women are equally as beautiful, but you know, <laughs> they, they speak Portuguese. Uh, so you're in Brazil and you're driving. Imagine a Curacao where when you pull into a service station and ask to put gasoline in your car, they look at you as if you're crazy and say, it's impossible. That's the world of Brazil. You cannot buy gasoline in Brazil at a service station. Only ethanol or an ethanol blended derivative. Incredible, hey? Brazil is totally self-sufficient with fuel for its transportation. I have Caribbean countries where 12 years ago, they were leaders in the production of sugar cane. Now, because of their agreements with the OECD, et cetera, they are giving away their fallow sugar cane lands. Nobody's eating sugar anymore unless it comes from the Latinos or from the Asians. If you could convert that land into cane-producing ethanol land, and if you could import the converters from Brazil, as opposed to just buying U.S. vehicles that run on gasoline directly. You end up with a transportation grid from the Caribbean that is using an alternative source of fuel and that makes you 
very much independent of gasoline, huh? And that is happening right now. The best practice is Brazil. If you can do that, you end up with a totally different scenario when it comes to your dependence, and it is very, very possible. By the way, the Ford Motor Company invented for the Model T the first engine, and that engine for the Model T Ford Company in the U.S. was powered by what? Ethanol. But the U.S. petroleum producers decided gasoline was cheaper, so they gave the engine to the Brazilians. <laughs> yeah, the Brazilians are using a Ford engine, modified, of course, etc., and now they are running off of ethanol while we're still using gasoline. There are other opportunities, some incredible opportunities for electric-powered vehicles and also for solar-powered vehicles in the Caribbean where we have smaller countries, so we don't need to meet the distance standards or the speed standards. That technology already exists, and those vehicles can be mass-produced in China if we created the market. So what am I thinking? I'm thinking the first solar ethanol manufacturer of cars should be right here where in Curacao. I want to represent that company, by the way. <laughs> and then you could export to the rest of the Caribbean because you're that, interconnecting company, you're that interconnecting country where South America meets the Caribbean and nobody gets through unless they stop in Curacao. So when we talk about alternative energy for transportation, which is the second major use of, uh, of energy in the Caribbean, that is the construct we can work towards. And because it's a best practice, it already exists, and because it's readily available imported technology from Brazil, you can actually get the Brazilian manufacturers and financing agents like the Inter-American Development Bank, where I served on the board of directors, to introduce those facilities into the Caribbean without the Caribbean governments firing a single shot. They just need to embrace it from a policy perspective. When we talk policy, we go back to the other use of energy, which is the grid. And from my construct, having spent some time in Israel, where you have a 92% solar penetration rate in the residential sector, Germany, who has the sun two-thirds of the day, where they have a 26% solar penetration rate, you must begin to understand that. It must be policy at the legislative level that must be causing us not to embrace something that's so obvious, right? Renewable energy. Now, what constitutes good policy? Well, if you study best practices in countries like Israel and Germany, when you want to introduce renewable energy, you must start at the very top with a policy statement, usually associated with where you've signed on to Kyoto or or Copenhagen, something like that. So the first thing the policy legislators need to do is make a statement. By 2020, 20% 20 of my grid will be renewable energy. Why isn't it happening? Well, you know, the oil companies, they pay for elections, they, <laughs> they, they fund culture, they do this, they do that. It's kind of strange why it can happen, but if you examine it, nobody can give you a rational decision. After you do that, and the policy starts from the very top, the second thing you have to do is you must go to the grid providers and you must decouple generation from transmission and distribution. If you decouple generation, you do that wonderful capitalistic thing where you introduce competition. You introduce competition in generation and what happens? Residential producers of power will invest in excess power for their homes. Maybe they might use wind, maybe they might use solar. And what will they do? They will pay for their investment by having a set price for on-selling onto the grid or by having reverse metering. So, if you decouple generation and then you introduce competition into generation, you create a whole new generation of empowered power producers. Each and every one of you will be sitting here talking about 
Well, how much did you sell your solar power? Well, I use Vestas, so I have wind power. And so the education process starts because you now begin to, begin to realize that power is energy. Energy is empowerment. And now you start to take control of your destiny. And when you do that, you take the power out of the fossil producers who are the big oil companies. You decouple it and you introduce competition, you have a totally different construct. Then legislatively, you have to set a price. Because a guy like me who finances energy deals, what I want to know is, if I invest in a solar station, or if I invest in a solar farm, or a wind farm, or an ocean thermal project, I need to know what my rate of return will be on that investment. Well, if I have a guaranteed purchase, purchaser, and there's policy on power purchase agreements or feed-in tariffs, as the, as the Europeans know, then I know what I'm going to be paid back for, right? So if you bring me a product, and your product has a guaranteed purchaser at a guaranteed price, and I'm a financier, what will I finance? The present value of the guaranteed stream of revenue from selling the power. That's the third part of the policy change that's necessary. The last part of the policy change is to put in place a robust financial network. And that robust financial network will involve the next generation of kids who, from my generation where we were trained to trade derivative swaps and hedges, they will be trading carbon credits. Because carbon output, the poisoning of the atmosphere, and the non-poisoning of the atmosphere is the next commodity. If I had some money and I was in the Caribbean, the first thing I would invest in is anything, anything associated with carbon reduction and water production. Water is life, and the Caribbean has a bunch of little islands where there's water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. And so, if you end up with a policy initiative that focuses on those four points, you end up with a climate where renewable energy on the grid where most of the money is spent will be spurred. Thereafter, you can focus on transmission and distribution. You can talk about interconnectivity where maybe Curacao produces electricity from its wind plants, its wind farms or its solar plants, and it has a direct voltage cable in the form of the telecommunications like Arcus Grid, and that, that power that Curacao is producing in excess, because all the Curacaoans have solar power, roofs, etc., can now be sent by cable to Trinidad and Tobago, or on to Barbados, or straight up to a big population center that really needs electricity, a place I was in last week like Haiti. If you have a grid that decouples generation from transmission and distribution, and you have a robust transmission and distribution network funded by interconnectivity between the islands and redundancy submarine cables running underground, because we all know about hurricanes, right? So it has to be underground and underwater where it's redundant. What we will end up with is a Caribbean as a region interconnected with inexpensive sources of power and therefore a Caribbean that is competitive. And what happens when you integrate electricity connection? Then you end up with integrated political constructs, integrated economic constructs, and later on integrated social constructs, which is after all what we all want. We all want one big Caribbean. So my vision, therefore, is one where we embrace renewable energy as a pathway to our future to be interconnected. And I see Curacao being at the center of the connection. I believe we have an opportunity to do that. I look forward to listening to the other presenters. And from the looks in your eyes, uh, I think you guys are going to write checks to me right now <laughs> so that we could move forward. I am very much appreciative to each and every one of you for your kind attention. And uh, Curacao is a beautiful place with beautiful people, and I'm just happy to be the thorn in the middle of all of these gems. So thank you very much, and good evening.